Hey everyone, welcome back to Raising Unicorns, a Harmon Brothers podcast, and in today's episode you'll learn about the four main tests we use to turn a brainstorming session into the best brand building name for your business. Unicorns are real. In the past eight years, Harmon Brothers has helped raise five unicorns. Yes, that's five companies with a billion dollar valuation, with at least six more companies right on the cusp of becoming unicorns. Here on Raising Unicorns, we share the lessons we've learned to help you grow your business by tens or even hundreds of millions of dollars. It's time to start raising a unicorn of your own. Hey guys, I'm pretty excited about today's conversation. So not a lot of people know this about Harmon Brothers, but we've named a couple of companies Yep. And, and even developed brands and logos around those companies. And we've actually developed a whole entire methodology for choosing a name for a company. And it's pretty dang cool. So I'm excited to share it with the world. I think this will be our first time, like, really just openly sharing this methodology. Yeah. Yeah, it is cool, actually. I When I came to Harmon Brothers, and I want to hear about some of these names in a second, Benson. But when I first came to Harmon Brothers, I came from agencies who also did naming and branding and did a good job of it. But one of the things that always sort of bothered me was that it was a number of creatives in a room brainstorming names. And then we presented those names to the client and kind of told them why we thought this name was good or why that one was good. But when it all came down to it, it was opinion-based, right? It was, these are our ideas that we're fighting for, which is fine and you should do that kind of thing. But I always felt like it lacked a little something. And so when I came to Harmon Brothers and saw the process that you guys had created, you know, I think the first time I saw it was four or five years ago, I was like, ah, that's it. That's what, that's what is missing from the process of coming up with a great name for a company. And one of the things that's so cool about it is that it kind of flips the, let's call it the mindset on its head a little bit. So many people think that when they're naming their company, they're like, oh, I've got to go out and choose the perfect name, right? Yeah. yeah. But they forget that, well, once upon a time, Google wasn't a perfect <laughs> name and Apple wasn't a perfect name and Nike wasn't a perfect name. Right. They only became the perfect name and the perfect brand after years or right. even decades right. of great branding, great storytelling, great products, great customer service, all of those things, turn those into world-class brands. Right. Enormous investment in the name is what made that happen, right? That's exactly right. And so when you stop thinking, okay, I got to go out and find the perfect name, and instead you kind of shift your mentality and say, I need to go find a name that I can turn into a great brand without it getting in its own way without it causing unnecessary friction and problems right. in us trying to develop it into a great brand name. Yeah. So actually, along those lines, Benton, I heard that you and Jeff Harmon created a company. This has been a long time now, but it was called Pixlin. You, tell you, me. You would bring that up, Brett. <laughs> yeah, t- tell me about that. Okay. So first off. It didn't exactly roll off my tongue, by the way. Right. So, right. No, so no offense. but Okay. In fairness, almost all successful entrepreneurs have a few failures under their belts, right? And uh, I'm going to be generous here. They're not failures. They're just not for profits. Yeah, exactly. Not for profits. So we're no different. So Jeff Harmon and I were college roommates. Right. Neil Harmon, another one of our partners, had built a company called Family Learn. And he, inside of that company, had developed this technology. And I'm trying to think of what year this was, but this was, I want to say this was like Oh, five, oh, six, okay. kind of kind of in that range. Mm-hmm. So it was like at the very beginning of the Web 2.0 movement. Yep. And this technology that he built, he built it, it was called iMemory Book. And what it allowed people to do was like if there was a funeral or a graduation or kind of one of these like events, mm-hmm. prior to the event, you could send out this invitation that would allow all the family and friends and everyone to type up a memory or upload some photos or whatever. Yeah, guest book sort of thing. Yeah, 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 kind of guest book style. And then iMemory Book would print it into these hardbound books. Quite frankly, it was just like five years too soon. Yeah. It was great idea, just a little bit too soon for its time. But Neil and his team over at Family Learn trying to, you know, push iMemory Book, they were focused mostly on the funeral industry. Hmm. And Jeff and I were college roommates, and we were helping Neil a little bit. And we had the idea that we could take that same technology and apply it to personal journaling. Because at the time, like, 
there was there no wasn't. yeah there was no online options yeah. for personal journaling it was the all options, handwritten yeah it was all either handwritten or a big Microsoft old, Word document yeah big old long Word doc yeah. yeah and so we took what Neil had built and we tried to build a company and our tagline was from pixel to print because the idea was you know okay. you type it keep it on the computer journal from anywhere blah 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 right. but when you're ready you can still print it into these hardbound books so that you still have your you know physical journals okay so and, far so good. Right. But Pixel to Print were like, let's name it Pixlin. You know, at the time, I think Flickr was big. Yeah, dropping some vowels or whatever. Yeah, was yeah, that was like the theme. And so we named it Pixlin. And uh, it was a horrible name. Like nobody <laughs> yeah. could remember it. You could go out and talk about it all day long. No one could remember it. No one could spell it. Yep. No one knew how to search for it. When people heard it, they thought, you were talking about like a pharmaceutical or something. Yeah. <laughs> Did you take your have, Pixlin? <laughs> have you had your Pixlin today? So yeah, that was a uh, that was kind of when Jeff and I first fell flat on our faces with an attempt to name a company. Yep. And so we quickly learned that there's got to be a better way. Right. Which started, I would describe it as a decade long process of experimentation that eventually you know resulted in the methodology that we have today, which we're going to talk yeah. about here. Now, obviously, any naming methodology has to start with a brainstorm, right? You have right. to think of a bunch of good names. Right. Or I shouldn't say good names. You have to think of a bunch of potential names, right? right? We'll right. decide later whether or not they're good. Yeah. And so, obviously, that can be as simple as, you know, you just sitting down, brainstorming yourself, and then going and bouncing it off of friends and family, business partners, employees, whoever. Right. Like, good ideas can come from anywhere, right? Right, yeah. Or... You can supplement that by turning to creative experts, if you will. So obviously at Harmon Brothers, we love comedians, right? Yeah. They're so good at entertaining. They're so creative. They're so talented. And they're fun to have on the team too. Yeah. Company parties, that kind of thing. <laughs> Makes it a lot of fun. So yeah. So going to that group of people with a brainstorm is a great idea to expand on your ideas and expand your list. And, but eventually, you know, you end up with this list of potentially hundreds of names. Right. Then it's time to, okay, now we have all these hundreds of possibilities. How do we whittle that down? Because eventually we need to land on one name. Right. Well, the whittling process as we see it is kind of twofold. The first part of it, you're trying to identify which of these names do I really like? Which of these names really have meaning to me? Which of these names do I really feel like we could build on and, you know, over the next decade, turn it into a world-class brand? Right. Because in that list of 100, 200, 300 names, that's it, most of those are probably pretty crap, right? And so you've got to find the ones that you, I think the way you've put it before is, I would wake up and go to work at that company. If yeah. it had that name, right? <laughs> and there are some companies where you just wouldn't do that. So that's a good first step, I think. And let's come back to this and we'll dive into it in more details because we actually have you know, metrics and qualifiers that you can look at to help you right. identify which of these names do you like and why. But there's this second part where it's saying, okay, now I have this list of names that I like, but which ones have red flags attached to them? Mm. And when I say red flags, I'm talking about which names kind of get in their own way. Right. Meaning if you want to go turn this name into a Nike or an Apple or a Google, which ones are going to have built-in friction that make that really hard to do? And so the more red flags a name has, the harder it's going to be to turn it into a great brand. And so right. that's the second part. That's where we're actually taking this list of names that we like. That's right. And then we're stress testing it to identify these red flags because it's not enough to have a name that you like. You need a name that you like, and it has as few red flags as possible so that it doesn't get in its own way. Right. Yeah, so that list, again, could be hundreds of names, and you could whittle it down to a name that you love and that you think fits your brand perfectly, and then come to find out, you know, you're a year or two down the road, and it has major issues that is, that's getting in the way of extending that brand and actually being successful with it. So let's talk about how we actually do that. You mentioned starting with the brainstorm. Yeah. Right? Well, I guess we already kind of covered the brainstorm, but, you know, Brett, you're a creative. You've done this many times. Any, I guess when you're just talking about the brainstorm itself, coming up with ideas, making a long list of potential names, any pieces of advice that you have there? Yeah. So one of them that I think we see as low-hanging fruit is people get on Google 
and start searching somehow, you know, for the Latin meaning of this thing or whatever. And and I don't know that that's as helpful as something like looking at the product or the brand that you're trying to name and thinking about all the different aspects of that product and coming up with a list that way first. So we recently did one for a mortgage company, right? And so we were thinking like, okay, what is the imagery that's tied to mortgages that we could play off of, right? And so one that I actually love, an existing company called Homey has sort of two meanings to it, right? So home is in the word Mm -hmm. and we all have homies, right? Like friends and things like that. And so as you're just looking at, you know, in particular, in this particular instance, real estate, what are the words that we can play off of? And that's often a way that, that we'll start to just iterate and brainstorm and come up with ideas that way. And I think it works better than Googling what's the Latin name for real estate. (laughs) So anyway, maybe starting from that position of just playing around with words and figuring out what are similar words and things like that and kind of going from there. But yeah, million ways to brainstorm. And that's like you said, it's not what we're going to necessarily focus on today. We want to get a little bit more into the rigor of it. But yeah, that that would be one tip. Yeah. So Pixlin was the beginning of our naming journey. And it was a train wreck, but it kind of set us on this, you know, I would describe it as like a decade long journey of kind of refining a better process that's resulted in, you know, the process that we have today. And included in that journey was Purple Mattresses. Right. So that name went through the exact process that we're going to talk about today. It came out of a brainstorm where not a lot of people know this backstory, but it's really cool. The inventors of Purple Mattress invented gel technology several years prior, and they licensed that technology out to all sorts of companies. The gel in its uncolored state is just kind of this translucent, almost like booger looking. Oh, nice. You know, it's just kind of this like yellowish green kind of nasty. Maybe not something you want to sleep on. Yeah, not exactly. <laughs> and so originally they had dyed it blue. Okay. And that makes it, you know, look way, way more beautiful. And so then that blue gel started getting put in all sorts of products mm-hmm. until the industry kind of latched on to this idea that gel is blue. Right. And particularly in the mattress industry, they kind of took that and for lack of a better term, bastardized it. They would take foam and spray paint it blue, and then call it gel foam. Really? And so, you know, years later, when those same guys had invented the purple mattress, which, you know, put that layer of gel all the way across the top of a mattress, which no one else could do. Right. They didn't want to go back and dye it blue because so many other of their competitors in the mattress industry were doing some version of, quote unquote, gel, but it was just blue foam. Right. And so they're like, how can we differentiate ourselves? And so they were afraid to use the term gel because that term had just been, you know. Everybody used it. And they were afraid to go with blue because that had been so, you know, overtaken. Right. And so they were experimenting with colors to dye the gel and they dyed it purple. Mm -hmm. And it looked really pretty and they liked it and they were ready to go with that. So when they were brainstorming for names for the brand, because they had this purple gel, they were like, well, what about purple and it made the list. Uh, And so when that list came to us for stress testing to identify, okay, well, what are the red flags? Right. It went through the same process that we're doing here. And we were able to stress test and identify that purple had the fewest red flags of all the other potential names. Interesting. And it ended up winning out. And I, I would argue it's become a really great brand. Absolutely. What other names have come out of this process? So another one is Angel Studios, uh, which is the studio behind The Chosen and Dry Bar Comedy and Tuttle Twins. We put it through this exact same process. So another great name. Yeah, great name, great, great brand. Logo. Yep. Great advice on brainstorming, Brett. Brainstorming is cool because it's something that anyone can do. You can just dive in and work on it. And a great idea can come from anywhere. But if you're ever in a situation where you're like, man, I just need some more creative juice. I just need some more minds on this. One area where we've had a ton of success is, you know, we develop a lot of comedy writers from the comedy industry. So we pull comedians from Dry Bar Comedy. We pull them from JK Studios, formerly Studio C, you know, the sketch comedy industry. We pull comedians from the improv comedy industry and we bring them in and we train them to write. Well, they also happen to be really great creative brainstormers. Right. And so if you ever find yourself in that brainstorming phase where you're just like, man, I just need some more creative juice, 
just reach out to us and we have a whole writer's room full of these world-class comedians who, you know, I don't know pricing right off head. It's not bad. It's really actually crazy as far as what you can get for a really reasonable price. Yeah. I would imagine that type of thing, you know, a brainstorm, it wouldn't be more than, you know, a couple hours work for a couple comedians or something. Yeah. But when you're talking about naming a company, a really reasonable investment for something like that to get some extra help from people who have done it a bunch and who have great comedy chops to help really get some great ideas out there. So yeah, you can reach out on my email, Benton at HarmanBrothers.com. I can put you in touch with our writer's room if that's helpful. Okay, Brett, now we got through the brainstorm. And our list is probably, you know. Too long. Yeah, way too long. <laughs> yep. Probably over 100 names, sometimes up to two, 300 names, right? Right, right? Now we need to whittle that down. Yeah. The first thing I think we like to do is just, and the easiest, by the way, is eliminate the things that you hate. Eliminate the names you know that aren't going to work for your brand. Yeah. Because the brainstorming process kind of expands out to, you know, friends and family. Yeah. People are going to come up with some ideas that just make you cringe. (laughs) Yeah, and we tell them that there's no bad ideas because we want to come up with a bunch of ideas. But in reality, there's some really bad ideas, right? (laughs) So get rid of those after the brainstorm has taken place. And that's when you can dive in and start narrowing things down to names that will actually work for the company. That's right. Okay. So once that's done, you know, you've just whittled it down significantly just by getting rid of those ones you hate. Now you're starting to think, okay, of these ones that are left, and there's still many, how do I identify the ones that are stronger than others? How do I identify the ones that I like more than others? What are some guidelines or even some rules of thumb that I can follow? Okay, so we have four very specific terms that we use to basically judge or give a grade to each of the names that you've brainstormed. I think one of the most important of these is actually, I would say, popularity, okay? And popularity can be done through voting if you have a number of team members that you can do that with. So the people that you choose to vote on these names or to help give you that popularity score need to be people who are familiar with the purpose of the brand, right? And as they go through those names, they should be able to easily identify names that won't work for one reason or another, and also help to evaluate some of these other categories that we're going to be ranking these names on. So the next one, that popularity, again, can take place as a simple vote. You could use a spreadsheet for that, send it out to the team or other trusted people to help you whittle things down, and then rank it from there. A quick note here. So let's imagine the brainstorm resulted in, let's call it 150 names. Mm. That step of eliminating the ones you hate probably just brought it down to, let's call it 130, 125, you know, somewhere in that neighborhood. The steps that Brett is now talking about, our goal is to get this down to, let's call it roughly 10, you know, maybe a dozen names that you feel like hey, these are all strong possibilities that could potentially work. And those are the names that we'll take into that stress test to identify red flags. But right now the goal is to go, you know, call it from 120 down to 12. Yeah, so it's a big whittling, right? And the reason being, and we'll get into what the stress test actually does and the steps in that, but you couldn't do the stress test on that 120, 150 names or whatever. So you theoretically could. It would just be expensive. (laughs) That's right. right. You could. And you could pay us to do it if you wanted. (laughs) But yeah, it would be very expensive. Okay. So the idea is use sort of crowdsource with people that you trust. I don't usually like to do this with, say, your spouse or, you know, your brother-in-law or whatever. The idea here is that you're using people who have familiarity with the company, with the goals of the company, that positioning and all that kind of thing to help get you some good input on which of these names would work really well for your brand, okay? So once you have sort of an idea of the popularity, some of those are probably going to start to rise to the top and help you whittle it down to that 10 or 12 that you were talking about. So the second thing that I would go to, and I would say from here, it's really not in any particular order, but we have something that we call brand legs or creative play. And so the idea there is that When you're creating, like you said at the beginning, Benton, when you're creating a brand, you're basically, with the name, you have an empty vessel, right? And then you have to fill it with things. And some names are so, you might say, bland that it's going to be difficult to add anything that will help that brand to stand out. 
whereas another name might be more creative and inspire more ideas that will help you in your branding efforts or your advertising or whatever it is to give it that creative legs or the, those brand legs. What else would you say about that? I think a great example of brand legs is like Geico, for instance. Geico sounds similar to the word gecko. And so, of course, they took that brand play between the brand and the gecko character, and they right. built this whole entire brand and universe and many, many campaigns all around that brand play. Um, another great example of brand play, so Nike, right? Nike is the name of the Greek goddess of victory. Right. And so that opens the door for all of this brand play around Nike being associated with victory, with champions, right. and that's great brand play. Another one, Google is the name of the number, I think it's the number one with 100 zeros, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Or, no, or sorry, today. a Googleplex is the name of the number. Okay. And Google pulled their name from the number Googleplex, okay. which represents this extremely large number, mm -hmm. which reflects on Google's mission to you know, make the world's information searchable. Interesting. So those are examples of brand play. Another one, we talked about Angel Studios. Angel Studios is dependent on thousands of angel investors who make the Angel Studios projects possible. Right. And so they built the whole name of the studio and the whole brand after the investors who make it all possible. So that's another example of brand play. A couple other notes here. When a name is super specific, mm -hmm. sometimes you lose the ability for brand play. Right. So for example, when a name gets so specific, the specificity oftentimes pushes out any opportunity for brand play. Right. And, and so when you get something like, you know, Joe's tax preparation and accounting, <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> Love Joe. so specific. It, it just describes exactly what the business is and what it does, but it makes it really hard to fill the brand with brand play. And you mentioned an empty vessel. You, you right. actually want an empty vessel that you right. can then fill with meaning. And if you go back and look at the great brands, the Apples, Nikes, you know, Googles, those were very empty vessels right. that over time they have now filled with meaning. And so now when somebody says the word Google to you, it fills your mind with not just ideas and emotions, but images and thoughts. And like all of that has been meaning that, that has been put in there over time. But then, of course, like you pointed out, if you go so generic, that can also be bad. How many companies have you seen that call themselves Apex something? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. they wanted to be first in the phone book back in the day. It was like <laughs> triple A Apex arithmetic or uh, accounting, whatever it was. Yeah, yeah, Apex this, Apex that. What's another one that's like that? Pinnacle, yeah. pinnacle this, pinnacle that, yeah. uh, pinnacle electricity. And yeah. you know, No and offense to those companies, by the way. I'm sure they're all great people. But it does make it hard to stand out from any potentially competitors, but just other companies in general. If you've heard Pinnacle, you associate it maybe with something or with a bunch of things and you just can't add that meaning to it that you would have wanted to, right? Yep. I think that goes a little bit to the idea of, well, more the good examples that you mentioned, which we all know, Apple, Nike, et cetera, goes to another category that we rank these names on and that's brevity. And so you used an example of Joe's tax services and accounting yep. or whatever, right? It's this big, long name, many words. Many syllables. Many syllables. But when you were listing out the good names that we know very well these days, Apple, Nike, one word, two syllables, and that's about as long as you get with some of these. Now, there's other good names that are going to be longer than that, but it is one of the things, one of the categories that we rank these names on so that we can start whittling them down to those names that we want to run through the naming stress test. And so brevity is an important one because if it gets too long, then you, it's going to be hard to type it into the browser. It's going to be hard to even remember all the words associated with the name, right? That's why KFC went from Kentucky Fried Chicken A to mouthful. KFC. A mouthful, yeah. Yep. International business machines became mm -hmm. IBM. Yep. Yeah. They had to abbreviate because it took too long to just say the name of the company. Yeah. Brevity is a, a super important one. And in fact, as we're ranking these, we tend to build out a matrix 
right. where on, you know, on one side of the matrix, we put all the names. And then on the other side, we put, you know, these different categories that we've talked about, the brand legs, the, you know, brevity is one of them. And we usually just score up by number of syllables. Right. And so the lower the score, the better in this case. All right. You mentioned we have the brand legs, we have the popularity, we have the brevity, and we have another one that we just call appropriateness. And it's interesting. I want to get your take on this because- You, you could also call that one like brand fit. That's a good point. So when you mentioned Nike, I didn't know how well that would score on appropriateness or Google for that matter, because I wasn't aware of the backstory on those. So with Nike, you have the Greek goddess. I think I'd heard that one before, but Google in particular, Googleplex, I think you said was the word. When you know that story, there's some appropriateness there because of that, right? What are the other elements that you would consider in appropriateness? Yeah, when you're thinking about brand fit, right, there are certain names that, you know, it might fit all these other things where it's brief, mm -hmm. it's popular, it has lots of brand legs and everything, but it might just like create images of a different industry or it might take your potential customers' minds to a, a place where you just don't want to, right. right? So one example that comes up is there is a bidet company that approached us and they named their bidet the Tushy, or I guess they named their company the Tushy. But it turns out, apparently, there's a porn site that's also called Tushy. Perfect. And, you know, don't, don't search for it. <laughs> don't search for that. You'll probably regret it. But that's an example where the name at first glance is, oh, that seems actually really appropriate for this bidet product. But because that's something that has already been you know, call it captured by another industry. Mm -hmm. Now, all of a sudden, that name has all sorts of baggage for your brand. Yeah, I don't know what you could do. So, I mean, when we talk about URLs, which we'll do in a second, like what could you do with Tushy to get them to the right place, right? It's really difficult because if you said get tushy.com, well, that's pretty bad connotation too in light of the other Tushy that's out there. So I'm not going to go Google it, but I do wonder how they're overcoming that issue with the name. I don't know how <laughs> well they're overcoming it, but I imagine no matter how well they overcome it, it's always going to be enormous friction in trying to create a great brand right. around that name. That's always going to be an obstacle that, that they're facing. And that's not what you want when you're trying to create a great brand, choose something that doesn't get in its own way. Exactly. Well, and I think that's actually the perfect segue into the second, what would you call it? The second part of this process. Yeah, the stress test. Right. This is where we're going to go in and say, okay, now we just whittled that list down to, let's call it 10, a dozen, you know, somewhere in that range. It could be a little more, a little less. Mm -hmm. But these are all names that you believe could become great brands given the right amount of time, storytelling, branding, all of that stuff. They all have potential, right? Right. But now we need to go really stress test those and identify which ones are going to get in their own ways, which ones have the red flags. So how do we go through the red flags? Okay. So I would say that when we get into the stress test, we actually do have a specific order that we want to run it in. And the reason for that is because, so as an example, we start with the domain name. Okay. So it's domain or URL availability. And the- Or I would add URL strategy because yeah. so, sometimes yep. a URL might not be available, but you can build a strategy that right. still works. Yeah. Most times these days, especially if you're looking for a one word domain, unless you have a ton of money, you're not going to be able to get that. Right. So in talking, going back to your example of Tushy, if tushy.com is already taken, well, what's your strategy to overcome that? And I don't know what theirs is, but that would have been, in our case of the naming stress test, that would have been something that would have been a huge red flag and essentially would have failed the name at that point, right? You just don't want to start a company with that much baggage and trying to overcome those odds. And so that's an extreme example, but when it comes to domains, because so many of them are taken, you do need to have some sort of strategy like you mentioned. On purple, purple.com was taken, of course, right? Yeah. All the one word domains right. are taken, but it wasn't taken, let's call it a really entrenched brand or company, which meant that, hey, there's actually a possibility that this domain name could be available. And so when we were building the URL strategy, we went out the door with onpurple.com. Right. I remember that. 
And we had actually approached the owners of purple.com. And at the time, if I remember correctly, they were willing to lease it with an option to buy. And that was for like 100K or something uh-huh. in that range. And if my memory serves correctly, we actually recommended that they do that. But at the time, you know, Purple was a, it was an unheard of startup. Yeah. And so the idea of spending 100K on a domain while you're still an unheard of startup was just unpalatable. Right. And so we ended up launching with onpurple.com. And I don't remember how long it took. I want to say it was two, three years later or something. They were able to come back to the table and they acquired purple.com. I think it ended up costing them. Probably much more expensive. Yeah, yeah. Point, I think right? it was several million dollars. So I don't know the details. I don't know the exact number. But that experience had a big influence when a few years down the road, we were helping name Angel Studios Getting the angel.com URL was a really big deal and a big part of the strategy. Mm -hmm. And so before ever launching, because we knew that if we launched, it would drive the price up. Angel Studios, before they were officially Angel Studios, actually went in and negotiated the domain name. And they got angel.com for $2 million. Steal of a deal. (laughs) It is. It It it, is now, right? It really is a steal of a deal. Looking at that, you'd be like, well, that's a lot of money for a domain name. But if they would not have used the strategy that you're talking about, it could have been five times that. It oh, could have e- been a ridiculous. Easily, just- if Angel Studios launched without that domain and they had the success right. that they're currently enjoying, where right. it, they did over $100 million last year. Yeah. And of course, the owner of purple.com would be seeing all that success and the price just goes up. And so right. in the case of Angel Studios, that made all the sense in the world. Right. And you know, even looking backwards, purple would have made sense too to get it early on at a oh, much, sure. much more affordable rate. But the point is, there are strategies. It doesn't necessarily have to be the .com. Sometimes right. it makes sense. Go ahead, pull the trigger, buy that sucker. Other times you can build strategies like on purple.com. Yeah, let me give one other recommendation when you're searching for that URL availability. One thing that was very prevalent, I think, and I hope that it has decreased in prevalence over the last few years, is basically squatters coming in and buying domain names, but actually talking specifically about what I refer to as snipers, okay? So a lot of times people will go and they'll look for a URL on Registrar, say Namecheap or GoDaddy or whoever. And what used to happen, and there have been lawsuits over it, is that employees of those companies or companies who have access to that search data will actually see the URLs that are being searched for, and then they will go in and purchase them. Knowing that someone else is interested. Knowing that there's interest there, right? And then they will squat on them and they will charge you a much higher price. Jerks. So, uh, yeah, it's they're jerks, exactly. So... The way to get around that is to come up with this list of, say, a dozen names and then be willing to invest a little bit, okay? So the first thing in the search that I would recommend is just type it into your browser window, right? Into your search bar. And if a website comes up, you know it's taken. If a website doesn't come up, in most of those cases, you don't know that it's not taken, but you know that there's a possibility that you'll be able to purchase that domain name, whether it's from a company that owns it but isn't using it or something like that, right? So don't go and search for these names on the registrar until you're ready to actually purchase that name. And so what you could do is once you have this list of names and you say, you know, I'm willing to invest a few hundred dollars in this, if the URL that I want comes up, I'm going to go ahead and buy it right then and there instead of saying, okay, well, now I'm going to go do the rest of the naming stress tests and I'll come back to it and try and purchase it because there is a small chance that at that point, somebody has sniped that name and now you're going to be paying more for it as well. So just a quick tip there. Yeah, a little bit of an insurance policy, right? right? It costs you a few hundred bucks, but right. you know, at the end of the day, most of those that you you buy and then you don't end up using, you just paid 10 bucks, you yeah. have it for a year and then you right. let it lapse, right? Yep, exactly. Or sell it on your own. You could be the squatter at that point <laughs> if you wanted. Okay, so that's, I think that covers URLs pretty well. And we do that again first because if there's a huge red flag on the URL, like it's a pretty easy disqualifier on these names that you've whittled down. The second thing that we then go to is legal defensibility. And the idea behind this one is doing a search, and usually it's a patent, trademark type search, that you can hire this out to have this done by people who have done it before. You know, paralegals can do it for a reasonable price, different people that have that kind of experience. But you're trying to make sure that if you choose this name, 
you're not, some other company's not going to come after you for using mm -hmm. it, right? Yep. Yeah. So I, it's a fairly simple one. Yeah. I don't have a lot more to say about that one. But once again, it's, we put it number two on the list. It's kind of a deal breaker, right? Yeah. If a name has major le legal defensibility issues, no matter how much you love it, it doesn't matter how good the name is or how well the brand legs or, you know, yeah, it's it, just not going to work. It's never good to start a company in the courtroom. So, yeah. and then the next one that we would move on after that is also kind of closely tied to legal defensibility, but it's differentiation. And that is generally talking about other companies in your industry and seeing how different the name is from those other company names so that you're not causing confusion in the marketplace. Because number one, that can create legal issues. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is that it can cause confusion among your market. And you don't want to start from that standpoint either. Yep. And I like to think about it, you know, even broader than just your industry. One thing that pops into my head is Nissan Car Company mm -hmm. and Nissan Family. It's a Japanese family. I don't know if it's still going on, but they were in legal battles for years over Nissan.com because the family owned it and the car company wanted it. And it was a messy, long, drawn out battle. And so you can end up in battles even outside of your industry. Right. But that said... If you find a company with a similar name, but they're in a completely different industry, right. it's completely tangential to what you're doing, very high unlikelihood that you're ever going to cross paths or that you're ever going to cause confusion in the marketplace between the two brands. Yeah, there's still the possibility that name could work for you. Right. But you best believe that Apple is going to go after any company in any industry, right, you know, right. that tries to name themselves Apple. Right. You know? Yeah. Don't name your company Apple. Don't name it Disney. These guys have really good lawyers. <laughs> so the differentiation there is just going to help you. Again, avoid some of those troubles. And then also the other side of that is just setting yourself apart from the competition, right? Be different so that when people think of your name, they think only about your company. Okay, so the next step of this test is, to me, one of the funnest aspects of this naming stress test. And again, in the stress test, what we're trying to do is identify red flags that should disqualify these names from being used as your brand name. And two of these kind of go hand in hand. They are spelling when heard and pronouncing when seen. Yeah, and this is big because this is the ability for your brand name to spread. It, yeah, I think Jeffrey calls it a word of mouth score is the way he talks about this, right? Yeah, because so much of the spread of your brand is going to come through either word of mouth, which that's the pronunciation when seen. When people see your brand, do they have the ability to go tell people about it? Right. So in the case of Pixlin, we never scored it back in the day. We actually should go back and, uh, and run this through the yeah. stress test just to see how bad it is. <laughs> I can already guarantee it's bad. <laughs> yep. But when people would see the name Pixlin, it was spelled P-Y-X-L-I-N apostrophe. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, man. You even threw in the apostrophe. Yeah, we had an apostrophe <laughs> oh, you in You got there. it all. So That's you can bad. imagine seeing that, and you would have no idea how to pronounce it. It'd yeah, be like right. Pikes Lynn. Yeah. You'd be trying to sound it out. Yeah. And when you would go to tell your friends about Pixlin, you would have no idea. How to spell it. Right. How to spell it, how to say it, yeah. anything. But this can actually be measured through survey right. data. We've built out survey technology that allows us to go out and survey the marketplace where we get several different pronunciations from around the country or even around the world if necessary. Right. And then we test it out and we say, okay, when people see this word or this logo, how do they pronounce it? Right. Is it how we want them to pronounce it? Mm -hmm. What percentage of them actually get it right? And that score matters. We've seen some names go through this stress test where they come out the other side with abysmal scores. Right. Yeah. I, we recently ran one of these for a client, and I think their score, particularly on spelling this word, was below 50%. That means that half of the people who hear the word couldn't go and spell it. They couldn't put it into an internet search and yep. come up with the correct result. And that is a quick way to kill a brand when nobody can actually get to where they need to go, right? Yeah. So we're talking about two simultaneously here. One is pronunciation when seen. The other is spelling when heard. An example that pops into my head is the Greek yogurt company 
Oh, right. It, You're going to have to pronounce it. I know, right? I think <laughs> – so it's spelled F-A-G-E, but if I understand correctly, it's pronounced something like Faye. Right. And they have had to invest enormous amounts of money into trying to help the marketplace understand how to say that brand name. Right. Because if you just see it and try to spell it, it's fag. Fag? I don't know. Fa- like, fagy? Yeah. You, I like it's dangerous. Yeah. And so if you're going to go home and say, hey, did you try out the fagy yogurt? <laughs> it's really hard for that to spread. And interestingly enough, when I first heard about Greek yogurt, you know, this was – it's been a decade or so, you know, 10, 12 years ago. That was the first brand I learned of. But today, I don't feel like it's the leading brand Right. You think of another name that's hard to pronounce, but not as hard to pronounce, right? Who would you say? I'm trying to remember. Brain fart. So mine, the one that I think of is Chiobani. I think that's how you say it. Chiobani, Chiobani. I don't know which way, but I know how to spell it. Yeah. I think, and I think I know how to, I I get closer to pronouncing that one than I would Faye. Yeah. I would argue that Chiobani is significantly easier than than Faye. Yep. Yep. Okay. So that's pronunciation. Of course, spelling when heard. Similar, once again, we have surveys that we can actually go out and we can have people pronounce it. And we Mm -hmm. get people with different accents and from different parts of the country and different ethnicities and all that. They go ahead and they pronounce it. And then you take that out in survey data and have people hear it and then try to spell it. Right. So you can identify how many people are going to be able to type this into the search engine. Yeah, it's incredible to see the results of those surveys because often what happens is, oh, I know this name really well. I know how to spell this thing. I know how to pronounce this thing. And then when you get it out to real people, it just, it can fall flat, right? Uh Or sometimes it performs magnificently. I mean, we've actually seen, we've run surveys where these names get 100% on spelling and on pronunciation. And that's great because it simply tells us, look, you ha- you're going to have no issues as far as spelling or pronunciation. It doesn't tell you whether it's the best name or not, but the ones that score low in this area are something definitely to consider and potentially be concerned about. Yeah, they have an uphill battle. Now, particularly in the spelling one, you can build strategies around dealing with it. So for instance, if you know the top misspellings, Mm -hmm. then you can go buy all the domain names that are misspelled and forward them straight to the correct spelling. Right. You can go on to Google and you can actually bid as keywords on the misspelled names. In fact, Poopery was an example where they had already named themselves. They had already chose their brand. When we came along, we said, man, this is actually pretty hard to spell. We should stress test it. Right. And we put it through this stress test And we identified, I don't remember the exact name, but there was a lot of misspellings. I want to say there was like 25 common ones, but there was even like a long tail of misspellings Uh where like people were spelling poopery in all sorts of creative ways. Right. And Well, because the puri part of it, right? Yeah, that's pretty. pretty, Yeah, pretty difficult to spell. It is a tricky word. And what that allowed us to do was once we identified all those misspellings, Poopery was able to go in and buy up the majority of those misspelled domains and then also bid on all the keywords of the misspellings. And just that alone, I don't remember the numbers on it, but it recaptured an enormous amount of business that otherwise would have been lost just by having the right strategy around those misspellings. Yeah. And for not a lot of money, right? To have those domain names, you know, like you mentioned, you're going to get them for 10, 15 bucks a year. So bringing in all that additional traffic that you would have lost otherwise is a pretty easy thing to do when you have that strategy right. And of course, the longer you're out there, the smarter Google gets around the misspellings too, right? right? Eventually, once Google captures those misspellings enough times, they start to understand what you actually meant. Right. But for a young startup... Google doesn't have the ability to give that benefit of the doubt. So this is important. Right. Okay. So that covers the stress test. So just to wrap it up and summarize what it is. So step one is come up with this huge list, this big brainstorm. Right. Whittle it down by getting rid of the ones you hate. And then identify all the ones that you think have potential. Look at the brand legs. Look at the brand fit. Look at the brevity. Look at the popularity. These things that help you determine which names are stronger than the others. Now shift your thinking. Say it's whittled down to about 10, maybe a dozen, somewhere in that range. 
Now it's time to go identify the red flags and see which of those names are going to get in their way. Instead of you just thought about why these names or what names are good, now you're going to look at why these names might be a problem, right? Yep. And that's where the stress test comes in. Yep. And that's where you look at the URL availability, the URL strategy. You look at legal defensibility. You look at differentiation in the marketplace. You look at pronunciation when seen, spelling when heard. And by going through this process, like I said, we always like to build out a matrix right. so that we score these things as we go so that we can see, you know, which name rises to the top. Right. And usually once you get through this, it'll pretty well have it narrowed down to one, two, maybe yeah. three names. But at this point, you know all three of those names. The red flags aren't there. The things that you're looking for in a brand, the appropriateness, the brevity, the brand legs, all of that is there. And so at that point, just choose. Yeah. Which one do you like the most? Right. And you know that with consistent effort around building a great brand and a great company, you can turn that into a world-class brand. Awesome. And again, like going back to what I said at the beginning of the podcast, having that process and feeling sort of that freedom at the end of the process to be able to say, okay, there's a couple or there's a few names here and I can choose the one that I like and not have to worry about all the other things that could come down the road by choosing a name that has some serious problems with it. Like that's freeing. And it's exciting to be able to go out into the marketplace with that name that has been tested in this way and that you can fall in love with and help your customers fall in love yep. with as well. Great brands are built, not found. So you just took the first step to say, okay, here's the name that I am going to go build into a great brand. All right, guys, I hope this is super helpful for you. And if at any point you want help, don't hesitate to reach out. You can reach out to me, Benton at HarmanBrothers.com. You can reach out to Brett at HarmanBrothers.com. Yep. We're happy to dive in and help. If you need help with the brainstorming from some of our creatives, we can jump in and help there. If you need help with the survey portion of it, we can help you get access to our survey tools that you can go out and collect that data in an affordable way yep. and in a timely way. So other than that, we appreciate you guys. Thanks for listening. And uh, we'll catch you on the next one. For many businesses, customer acquisition and ad buying has been a nightmare ever since iOS 14. If you want help navigating the craziness of the e-commerce market, Harmon Brothers is offering a free webinar with three golden metrics you've probably never heard of. These metrics could help turn your company into a money-making machine. Just email us and we'll send you our value-packed video. You can reach us at podcast at harmonbrothers.com. Once again, that's podcast at harmanbrothers.com.